但是飘离。我在老家动过私手，我去过县城，我就想看一眼上海长么子样。我就是害怕，我怕会死掉的，死掉了什么都没有。人来人，我要回去，我要回去。一个人一个命，家里派位早就立好了。谁说的？你良心的话，丈夫徐国是位心思。谁把谁的弟兄们？你们有你们，上海还在。与之无期哀见，主子张大承认，仍宜当军人，为父报仇，为国尽忠为义，让我子孙后代再不受此屈辱。Good afternoon. My name is Human Chan, founder of the UK-China Film Collab, a non-profit organization uh, set up to inspire and encourage more film-related activities and debates between the two countries. Today it is my pleasure to have invited two very special guests to join me for this online discussion panel to talk about the latest Chinese box office hit and epic war film, The 800, directed by Guan Hu. The 800 is set to be released in the UK across major cities on the 16th of September. So the guest with us today, we have Professor Rana Mita, a scholar and historian who specializes in the history of the Second Sino-Japanese War, which is also the film The 800 setting. And Rana is the director of the University's Ox University of Oxford's China Center and a regular presenter for the BBC on China. And we also have Cedric Barrow, who is the managing director of Trinity Cine Asia, the distribution company behind the 800s release in the UK. Cine Asia is a leading uh, distribution label in the UK for Chinese language films. They have previously released films such as The Detective Chinatown 2, Wolf Warrior 2, Pegasus, Youth, and many more, and many more to come. So welcome both. Rana and Cedric. Hello. I very much look forward to our discussions today. The 800 has grossed 260 million pounds to date as we speak and being one of the highest gross box office film in our very special year 2020. So Cedric, what is the 800 about and what makes it so special? Well, it's, it's about the um, soldiers that were left to defend Shanghai as the Japanese army was closing in in the city and they hold themselves up in a warehouse called the Saiheng Warehouse, right in the middle of the city to defend uh, that um, last standing ground in a hopeless battle because they were completely uh, outnumbered and outrun by the Japanese. But they chose to do, defend it symbolically to, uh, to show they were prepared to fight and, uh, uh, until the end. And also because it, it happened in the middle of Shanghai, in the middle of the city. 
So in, in the middle of a co cosmopolitan city, you suddenly have a war siege. And the concessions were just across the river from, from the warehouse. So the whole world was, in, in, in effect, spectators uh, to the battle. And I'm saying uh, spectators because that was why that battle was so special as well. It was one of the first, if not the first, battle siege to be broadcast globally as it was taking place. So, of course, before the age of internet, but, you know, for example, AFP and Reuters were actually watching the battle as it unfolds from across the river. Um, and I think that's why there's a significance to that, you know, uh, battle and uh, like a relevance today as a first globally broadcast battle, which is a battle which, which was fought without the hope to win, but with the hope to win, sort of, to score media points, if I can say. And what, make, what makes this film so special that people have to go and see? It's an epic war film. It's an uh, incredible spe spe spectacle. It was uh, the first um, Chinese film um, shot in IMAX entirely. And um, the story of the making of the film is as epic as a battle in the film, because it's a labor of love for Guan Hu that started uh, more than 20 years ago in his mind. And uh, uh, the production itself started in 2015. And uh, so the film has been in the making for five years. And uh, it was one of the biggest, one of the biggest uh, Chinese films ever made, $80 million budget. And really the director was meticulously tried to recreate that setting, uh, mm -hmm. which in fact was shot not very far from where the uh, events uh, actually took, took place. And over, over eight months, uh, uh, 1,500 people were involved in, in the con construction of the decor. Um, the last scene took 45 days to shoot. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it was stopped many, many, many times because of uh, rainfall that destroyed the set. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's, 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 there are endless stories about the making of the film that I could go on a long time, but it's just, it's a sort of, in content, it's closer to Dunkirk, but in production terms, it's probably like a, like, a bit like Apocalypse Now, because it's <laughs> kind of this film beset by all sorts of uh, dramas and uh, tragedies. And to top it all, it was, when it was finished, it was about to open the Shanghai Film Fe Festival last year. The day before the opening of the festival, it was pulled by the censors for unknown reasons. And it remained stuck in censorship um, until the end of last year. And at, at the end of last year, there were rumors that the film could be released. Uh, there was there was eyeing a date close to Chinese New Year. And then, of course, <laughs> what happened? COVID hit. So it was uh, uh, delayed another six months. So it's a, an epic film, an epic battle to get it on the screen. Um, well, an epic battle to get it made, then to get it on the screen. And uh, it's a battle that uh, has um, fun, finally been won. Because as you say, the film has just cost just $300 million mm -hmm. at the box office. And that's made it the most uh, successful film of 2020 so far around the world. Very exciting. So long waited then. And Rana, yeah. I would like to talk a little bit about the history of the setting of the film. And first of all, did you like the film? And second, second of all, in your research and your books, you often talk about an argument uh, uh, about China being a forgotten ally in the Second World War. And how does the film may or may not reflect on your arguments? Human, thank you. Um, well, first of all, very important to say I did very much enjoy the film. I thought it's absolutely spectacular. Uh, I only was able to see it on a preview link, so I did not see it in its full IMAX glory. And I think it would be worth seeing again, really, on a very big screen because it's such a spectacular film. And it's not short, it's uh, about two and a half hours long, but there's a tremendous amount that unfolds on the screen while that's going on. I mean, there are some great Chinese movies set during the Second World War years. I think probably one of the finest, even, even now, years later, is uh, Lu Chuan's movie, Nanjing, Nanjing, uh, released in the West under the title City of Life and Death, about the horrific killings in Nanjing in 1937. 
uh, I would say that this film is more spectacular. That film is more, more intimate. And perhaps that other film, Lutrans, has perhaps greater emotional depth than this one does. But having said that, there is a tremendously skilled way in which uh, Guan Hu, as Cedric said, a kind of labor of love, draws the individual characters that become part of this much bigger landscape. So I think it's a film that repays seeing and watching quite, quite carefully, and I suspect I'll see it more than, uh, more than once. But you're right to say that it's of particular interest to me as a historian of the Second World War period in China, and in particular of this, this, this battle, the Battle of Shanghai, in the autumn of 1937. So just a very quick reminder, I know some viewers will know this and, and others uh, will perhaps be less familiar, but the Second World War period in China was a long and devastating one. Uh, China fought longer than any other of the allies. The war broke out in 1937, not 1939, as it did in, in Europe, and ended, of course, in 1945 with the uh, surrender of Japan after the atomic bombings and the invasion of Manchuria. But during those eight years, the invasion of China uh, led to over 10 million deaths. Some numbers have been as high as, as 14 million, both civilian and military, both from direct uh, instant uh, killings and also diseases and other factors that pushed up those, those horrific numbers even further. 80 to 100 million Chinese became refugees in their own country during those years. And the infrastructure of China, the railways, the roads, the telecoms, the business networks, all of them were really smashed off and beyond recognition during those years. And yet, and this should not be forgotten, but often is in, in the West, more than half a million Japanese were held down in China by the continued Chinese resistance from a variety of, of different forces. So in those terms, the Battle of Shanghai sits as one very important episode in a much bigger war. And Shanghai was as Cedric has said, in some ways a kind of showcase, but also a tragic battle. It lasted really from August of 1937 up till the beginning of November. And by the autumn, the late fall of that, that year, uh, it was clear, I think, that the defending Chinese soldiers would not be able to hold out against the, the Japanese forces. And while retreat was ordained, Chiang Kai-shek, the Chinese leader at the time, made it clear that at least some troops should try and resist as long as possible to show the world that the Chinese didn't simply turn around and flee, but resisted very, very bravely. And this film tells that story of that one place, the Suhang Warehouse, which is, by the way, a tourist site today. And I gather since the movie, you know, thousands of people have been going to, to visit uh, the, the warehouse here itself and giving a slightly fictionalized, but basically fact-driven account of that one episode during the three months of, of battle in, uh, in Shanghai. So it's an event that's legendary in the Chinese history of World War II. And this movie gives it a much wider, audience, not just for the West, but also I think for young Chinese who maybe don't know as much as they might do about the war. And do you think that's a good thing? That um, a film that is fact-driven, as you said, but um, fictionalized on a more epic scale, spectacular? Oh. spectacular. Oh, yes. I mean, you know, movies are movies. They are not history books. Uh, as someone who writes history books, it's very important that the books that people like me write have lots of footnotes and sources and <laughs> do not, you know, reflect on anything that isn't factually provable. That's not the job of a movie. A movie is to, to, to try and create a mood. So, you know, Christopher Nolan's movie Dunkirk, which was actually a big hit in China, and I think Cedric mm. uh, mentioned that, that was actually um, a film that, of course, was based on an immensely important British moment of the war, but obviously the characters in it were fictional they weren't necessarily exactly like that in, in real life. So I think there's nothing wrong with, um, you know, some of the changes, for instance, I won't give any details uh, or specifics away because people should go and see it. <laughs> but one very important character does die in the film who didn't actually, his equivalent didn't die in real life. I, I won't say more than that, but obviously in a film like this, it can be quite poignant when a character you've been living with on screen falls and is, is sacrificed as part of the film. So I understand for reasons of emotion, reasons of narrative, why a filmmaker sometimes changes the plot, the, 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 the detail. That doesn't mean that in terms of emotion or in terms of the overall story, it's mm -hmm. in any sense inauthentic. I think I know which character you're talking about and I'm going to keep that as a secret as well. Please so do. I would, <laughs> talk... he, gets, he gets shot, but we're not sure if he dies or not. That's a good point. That's a good point. Well, there you are. And now you've we've tempted everyone to going and going and going and seeing. It. Perhaps, perhaps uh, this character is one you want to keep your eye, keep your eye. Like the usual suspects, you don't know which one it is till the end. <laughs> yes. So since we're talking about war films now, I'm going to um, pass the question back to Cedric too. Again, 
Um, so how is the 800 different from 1917, for, for instance, um, which is all, also a very well received war film um, internationally? I think Rana is, is uh, uh, spot on when he compared it to Dunkirk, because that's, that's, the most, that's the more obvious um, film to uh, hold against um, the 800. It's, uh, 1917 happens to be the same year as uh, the 800. Uh, and you could say, so this is the, you, you know, the Chinese war film of the year, as was uh, 1917 was a British slash American uh, war film of the year. Um, and there are, of course, two, two very different um, views on, on war, but they're different wars as well. And uh, 1917 is a much more intimate, in a way, uh, journey, even though it's got this, even though the background is as epic as um, the 800, or not, not quite as epic, but <laughs> maybe uh, leans that way. But I think it focuses on a journey of one ca character who has to deliver a message Mm. It's a very different story about an ensemble uh, cast, if you want. So a group of people who have to fight and uh, who are doomed, in, in a sense. So in that respect, it's closer to... Uh, I mean, Duncan, yes and no, because Duncan was a, was, a, was a retreat. This is not, this is not a retreat. It's, uh, it's a retreat only at, at the very end. So it's more almost like a classic, it play, for, for me it plays out more like a classic Western, <laughs> like a uh, Fort Alamo type with, with the engines come, coming in and then being holed up and defending, mm -hmm. uh, uh, showing a lot of co courage against, um, you know, a, a, a sort of doom scenario. I, I think that's the key thing if I may come in here. I think that, one of the things that's most interesting, and maybe what was problematic for some people in, 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 in the Chinese establishment about this film, is that it is the story of the defeat. I mean, that, that is not, I think, giving anything away in the plot. In the end, you know, the warehouse holds out for four days, and that's, that's well known beforehand, in fact. But it's the way that the resistance carries on in this sort of heroic but doomed way that, uh, that, that makes, the, makes, the, makes the film. In that sense, it has a similarity to Dunkirk, which obviously is the story of a, of a major retreat by the British, which eventually leads, as in China also, to a victory in 1945, but they don't know that, that at the time. But there's also an element, if you think about some of the great World War II films in the European tradition, immediately after the, the war, in the decades of the, the 50s and 60s, like Andrzej Wajda's uh, movies, uh, Canal and uh, Ashes and Diamonds, those are about people who essentially lose, you know, the Warsaw Uprising, uh, uh, which took place under Nazi uh, assault. But it's the heroism of the resistance, not the fact that they lose, that is at the heart of the film's power. Mm. So, um, Rana, in your new book, I know that your new book is coming out about the same time as the film's uh, release in the UK. Coincidentally. Coincidentally, uh, China's Good War. Good war. And, and in your new book, you mentioned that you also included the, in the event prior, prior its release in China. And why do you think it's important to have it mentioned in a, in a history book? On China. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, it is a coincidence, but for me, a very happy coincidence that my new book is coming out next week as we're speaking. That's mid September, and that's the release date in the United Kingdom of the movie uh, The 800, because of course it's already been on release in, in China for some uh, weeks now. The book essentially argues that you cannot fully understand the kind of public and popular culture of China today if you don't understand how important that period of the Second World War, you know, Kang Zhan, the war of resistance against Japan, is still today. And the book is not just about movies, it's about museums like the, uh, the Museum of the War of Resistance, the uh, Kang Zhan Jinyanguan mm -hmm. in Beijing. Um, it's also about international relations, the way that issues like the Cairo Declaration of 1943, still really important in shaping Chinese foreign policy. So it's about all aspects of Chinese life. If you look hard enough, I say, you can find the Second World War period is everywhere. But yes, movies, of course, are a central part of that. And I use several movies to try and make the point that actually China still really has part of its culture that harks back to those years of the the war against the, the Japanese. Some other movies in recent years, some of which Cedric may have been involved with, uh, the movie Cairo Declaration back in 2015, uh, Dong Feng Yu, uh, The uh, East Wind Rain mm. that came out about 10 years ago. There's a whole range of them. But this movie, uh, The 800, Bye Bye, came into my book for a slightly unusual reason that Cedric referred to. But when I finished 
writing the book and it's just coming out now so I haven't had a chance to update it yet. The movie actually was made but not yet released. Um, we don't know the full reasons for the film to have been pulled from the Shanghai Film Festival last year in, in July but reports have it that there were some people in the Communist Party who felt that it was inappropriate for a book that is mainly about Kuomintang nationalist soldiers, not communist, but nationalist soldiers, to be released in the 70th anniversary of mm. the uh, uh, founding of the Chinese Communist Party, but that it was okay a year later, because as you'll know, this year, 2020, is 75 years since the victory against Japan, the so-called VJ Day in Britain, as well as in, in China, of course, as it happened. So I think the idea was that it was more historically appropriate to release it this, uh, this year. So I talk a little bit in the book about, you know, why a film like that, which is about the Guomindang, who also, you know, who played essentially this very important role in the war as a whole, and of course, were the people who fought in Shanghai. Um, why a movie about that, on the one hand, is politically sensitive in China. On the other hand, I think it also pushes back against the slightly crude idea that maybe some observers in the Western world have that anything that's not about the Communist Party will be banned in, in China. And that, of course, is not true. Mm -hmm. This movie has nothing really to do with the Communist Party at all, but because it's telling a story about Chinese resistance, regardless of the party uh, that is involved, um, it was able to actually you know, be released in a different context to do with the Second World War. And explaining those nuances, not just in cinema, but in all sorts of other areas, and the importance of that war against the Japanese is at the heart of my new book, China's Good War. And I think everything, when it comes comes to censorship, everything is symbolic. It's under, it's always understood in, on a symbolic level and what it means to uh, in a particular year or at a particular time. And talking about the role in, in the war, Britain also play a role in the narrative of the film and also in the history and well in the war itself. And what kind of role did Britain play? Well, I think in the actual war, the British role becomes more important as time goes on. So in the first four and a half years of the war between 1937 and Pearl Harbor in 1941, in terms of combat fighting, the Chinese forces, mainly nationalist troops that set battles and also the communists for some of the guerrilla warfare, they're both, both involved, um, really do most of the fighting themselves. I mean, there is not significant foreign assistance apart from some Soviet fighter pilots. But we do know the British actually gave a significant amount of assistance in terms of financing of some of the Chinese war effort, particularly through Hong Kong, which then mm. was, was, was then a, a British colony. In the wider sense, the film includes that role without necessarily putting it at the center, but it's a, I would say it's quite an ambiguous role. And I say that because the setting of the film is on the border between the Chinese part of the city and the part that's called the International Settlement, which was controlled by an international Western uh, Council, joint Westerners, Japanese, and by the Enston Chinese as well, to, to be fair, but with a very British flavor about it. And I think there's this strong sense, on the one hand, of the British being sympathetic. On the other hand, they're not doing very much. You know, the Japanese are basically destroying the Chinese part of the city. Meanwhile, the International Settlement is neutral and is terrified about the thought that the fighting might leak over the bridge or the barbed wire fence into the settlement itself. So I say that the British are portrayed in a sympathetic but not very heroic light. Talking about um, interactions then between China and, and the UK, I'm going to take the question back to Cedric about releasing Chinese films in the UK more, more modern now. And what are the challenges uh, that, you, that you or your company face or have been facing uh, in terms of distributing Chinese language films in the UK, Cedric? Well, I mean, obviously this year is a very special year, so it's a challenge for everyone to put films out, um, of course. But um, traditionally, when you're looking at um, foreign language content, which is how, as you know, this is seen, it's, it remains very hard to put subtitled films into cin cinemas in, in the UK. Uh, just because the market share is so small and there's a sort of, you know, uh, um, blanket reaction which is, oh, okay, is it not a film in English? So do I have to actually read subtitles? And that always puts you in a category of, you know, the subtitle films, the foreign language films. Um, however, there is, uh, there is an audience, there's a loyal audience to go and see Chinese films in the, in the UK. Some of them are Chinese students, um, some of them are, you know, uh, people who settled here and who are of Chinese 
culture or have, 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 have heritage or speak Chinese or want to learn Chinese. Uh, and that audience is, is quite a faithful audience. So you can actually release a film around the country target, uh, while you target this audience. But, and also, of course, uh, try to reach a bigger audience because that's, that, 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 that is always our uh, goal. Um, but I think it's something that we've been working on a long time, uh, a few years now. And little by little, we can see that audience increasing. And of course, we know the channels of how to reach that audience better. And it's really about making a film like this accessible to a wider audience, uh, which of course depends on the film itself a lot, but also on the marketing of it. So uh, our sort of, our challenge, if you want, is to market it in a way that can appeal to, uh, to, to a wider audience. And I think with, with this film, we do have a chance because uh, the whole idea of the battle, the whole, the whole setup is something I can speak to um, an English audience. But, and of course the spectacle, the, the, the IMAX thing, the, the fact that it needs to, 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 to be seen on the screen, not to forget the international box office, which is a story in itself and make people curious because they, they, they just want to see what well, we've heard about this film in, in, in the press, you know, as the highest grossing film of the year. Let's go and take a look. So all these elements can uh, definitely help us, uh, but it's, it is an uphill struggle, of course, and, and still is. Uh, uh, that being said, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very glad that we're able to have the uh, backing of most of the chains to uh, try out these, these sort of films and to uh, try out new sites every time. So when we were going to release Detective Chinatown 3 earlier this year, which is a sequel to a, a very well-known uh, uh, Chinese fran fran franchise, we were on more than 60 screens, which is uh, very rare for, I think it's unprecedented for a Chinese film to, 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 to be out on so many screens, you know, except for hark back to the days of um, Crouching Tiger, he hidden the dragon, which was a specific case. So we, we can see that we are making headway with the audience here. And I, I think it's just a matter of carrying on. And of course, it's very uh, dependent as well on getting good films, mm -hmm. like the 800. And do you think that 800 is one of those crossover uh, title, um, potentially? I think it has a fighting chance, which is... Yeah. <laughs> Um, but um, of course, it's not the best time to be releasing a film right now. So we we just don't know how how, how it's going to uh, play out. But we are giving the film a chance. Exhibitors are also giving the film a chance. So I have to be very thankful to mm -hmm. to them. Um, and we'll 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 see what happens. But I think whether it works on the screen or not during this COVID time. Uh, because God knows what's what's going to happen. Uh, so, you know, things 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 change every day. Um, I think it'll definitely be a, a film which will have a big audience on the other media as well. Mm -hmm. So I think the film will have a long life on uh, on digital. Uh, I've already got interest from you know several platforms uh, and on uh, DVD and Blu-ray as well. Because there's, there's an appetite for um, physical media for these kinds of films, especially about World, World War II. Not so much about the Chinese or the Sino Japanese angle of World War II. But I think a battle like this is of interest uh, to anyone who watches World War II films, of which there is quite, quite a large audience. So I think um, I have a final question for you both. One for Rana, why should people see this film? And one for Cedric, why should people see the film at a cinema? Well, I would say, first of all, people should see the film because I think it's an engaging and gripping film. Uh, it tells a good, strong narrative story that will you know, pull you along if you're willing to give it the time. And I'd say that it is sometimes tougher for Western viewers to get it to, as Cedric says, you know, subtitle films, ones that demand a bit more historical knowledge and attention than something you're very familiar with. But I'd say this one 
it's certainly worth uh, the effort. You might even want to check out uh, one whose previous uh, Second World War movie, uh, Donio, uh, Fighting for the Cow, which is a, a black comedy, very different sort of film as well. But I'd start with, with, with this one first because it is more accessible. The other reason is that I would say clearly, I think it is one angle into what I still think is by far the least appreciated story of the World War II um, era, the Chinese theater of resistance, which is often kind of folded in with the Pacific theater where the Americans had a, you know, bigger, a bigger role. The China theater was both long and bloody and was also one that I think without the Chinese resistance, the fate of the rest of the world would have been very different. And yet the Western world really knows very little about this, this particular battle. It's why my previous book about World War II in China, the American title was Forgotten Ally, because I think we have tended to forget that China was, you know, not only alongside us, but fighting first as one of the allied powers. So as a sort of window into an important historical moment, I think the film is worthwhile by, by all means, but I think it's also very worthwhile as actually a very, very good, very worthwhile piece of cinema. I think uh, you should see the film at cinema because it's going to blow you away with my, my sort of one, 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 one line. It's such an epic spectacle and there's so much attention to, to detail. And uh, I, I just don't think I've ever seen a, uh, I've ever seen a battle portrayed on screen in, in, uh, in, in such a way. So it's, it's up there with, you know, the Seven Private Ryan, the Dunkirk, so 1917 as an admissible film uh, about war. But it's not just a film about war, it's a film about people who are fi fighting war. So it's, it's very much a character film at the same time. So for me, the, the interest, the, the, the value of seeing it at cinema is to really be close feel close to the soldiers, uh, hold, 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 hold up in that warehouse, looking at the enemy coming on one front, not knowing when and how, and you know, knowing that they might be destined to, destined to die, but not sure when it's going to happen. At the same time, looking on the other side to see a uh, cosmopolitan city with all the riches of uh, 1930s Shanghai, looking back at them and being in that place. And I think the, the, the film does an incredible job of putting you in that place and about the fear, the hope, and uh, just the uh, intensity, and the brutality of war when it dawns on you. Thank you. And I also, if I may, I'll add my personal opinion on why people should go and see this film in the UK. I think that 800 is a very good film to invite those who not, do not necessarily care about the history or the historical connection between the two countries uh, for them to have a, a new knowledge or new curiosity that in fact uh, the UK and China were in many different activities together whether for wars or for trade and I think it is a very good medium, mass medium to open the public debate or further public debates that today's media might not uh, necessarily deliver, I think. So that's my personal view. So may I close then to do two plugins. Rana's new book, uh, China's Good War, uh, will be published on September the 15th by Belk Net Press. It is now available on Amazon. The 800, an epic Chinese war film, that is taking the highest box office in 2020, will be releasing in the UK on September the 16th across major cities at your local cinema. Tickets now are now available on sale, I believe. Yeah. And if you are interested in the history of China, the history of the Second World War, the past, present, and the future of the UK-China relations, a film and then a book is perhaps the best combination for your intellectual stimulation. Thank you very much for your time, Rana and Cedric. And I shall you, hope to see you both very soon in person. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hugh. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.